just to recap briefly, to put today's agenda into the context of the workshop as a whole, we started off yesterday with a very high level overview of a survey conducted by Echelon Insights on behalf of the National Academies on public perceptions of scientific research that involves animals. The results of this survey, which were consistent with numerous other surveys that have been conducted over the years, but provided more detail and raised many more questions to dig into, um, prompted the roundtable of the Board on Animal Health Sciences, Conservation and Research to sponsor this workshop. Then we had three sessions to explore the perspectives of some of the stakeholder groups with whom scientists want to communicate effectively. As a reminder, for the purposes of this workshop, we're using the term scientists as shorthand to refer to the subset of all scientists who are involved in scientific research that requires the care and use of animals and want to communicate effectively about it. And that includes all of those who prefer, provide support to that research, taking care of the animals, overseeing the research and so on. Um, so we first considered advice from Paul McKellips and Matthew Rassett for scientists speaking with the media. We learned from Jessica Kwan and Katie Serafin about the perspectives of non-scientists trying to understand how scientists and lab animal veterinarians think about research with animals. And Simmer Bajaj and Marie Brake shared with us some insights into what journalists are concerned about in their work. We also learned from Allison Bennett about topics that she finds to be inadequately communicated by scientists. And Lisa Hare Levin uh, discussed with us the issues about research that does not involve work with an living animals, which are worthwhile for scientists to know about when trying to communicate effectively with the general public. Today, we will gain insights into the perspectives of another stakeholder group, that of institutional leadership, which necessarily cannot focus exclusively on research with animals, but must manage much broader considerations. And we'll dig into um, other topics related to the spectrum of openness as it relates to effective communication about research with animals, communicating about the ethics related to research with animals, and communicating on social media about research with animals. As Margaret noted yesterday, the order of presentation of the topics does not reflect anything about their perceived importance. The planning committee considers each of the topics to be an essential element of the workshop, and the order was mostly dictated by logistical considerations. We will conclude with a Q&A session with a panel of the workshop presenters. We encourage you to send your questions as they occur to you by entering them via the Q&A function in Zoom. We will try to address as many of the questions related to the focus of the workshop as possible, giving priority to the ones that are brought up by the most people. The planning committee members and presenters are also encouraged to engage in dialogue with the presenters in each session. For the attendees, we would love your feedback on this workshop and we'll be sending out a brief survey afterward to all those who registered, so keep an eye out for that. Now we'll get started with today's workshop with a presentation about USARO, and I will turn this over to Crystal Johnson to introduce our presenter. Crystal. Good morning. Our next presenter will be Nicole Nabatil from Sterling Biomedical Resources. And the um, session objective for um, session number seven is to provide information about an initiative to encourage openness in the US about scientific um, science research involving animals. Nicole is the president and founder of Sterling Biomedical Resources, LLC, which provides a wide range of business services, including communication, change management, and strategy development. Their mission is to support small businesses in the biomedical industry, offering new and innovative technologies and new models that will improve animal welfare and improve translational data derived from animal studies. 
Today, Nicole is coming to us to speak more about the U.S. Um, ARR, ARO initiative, where she has served as the um, as a member of the U.S. AR, ARO initiative steering committee since its inception, and she is the chair of the survey committee. Nicole has published several paper, papers and resources on the care use of large animal models. More about her research can be seen and her bio can be seen on the um, program. Nicole? Hello. All right. Thank you so much, Crystal. And uh, thank you so much to Alice and the committee for the privilege of being able to be here today and to um, Nia and Mariah for all the support and, and help getting me here. So I'm just really excited to be here to talk to you about um, the U.S. Animal Research Openness Initiative, which is something that's very important to me. So I'm going to go through um, kind of who we are for those of you who aren't familiar with it, what our goals are, what our work has been so far. And then I'm going to kind of take the opportunity to also interject some of my own experience as someone who's gone through the journey of um, go, coming from someone who's gone through the journey of actually writing a paper against animal research when I was in high school to being a scientist, working with animals in research, to being a communicator to both other scientists and the public about animal research and how, and some of the tips and tricks that I've learned through that journey. So I'm gonna try to include all of that in this presentation. So um, where is the, I didn't prepare and get my clicker. Okay. So the U.S. Aero Initiative was really born out of the fact that several countries, I want to say, um, I think there's 10 now, have formal research agreements um, amongst research institutions in those countries. And so um, several years ago, there was a dialogue around, um, should the U.S. be doing this? Could the U.S. be doing this with our, our landscape? Um, should we have some sort of agreement? And, and so a, a group of, of a lot of representation from academia, um, pharma companies, um, really, really a, a lot of key stakeholders and in industry met to discuss this topic. And what we came to the conclusion of is that um, we should move forward with an initiative and that would make it um, easier to have the dialogue with um, institutional leadership. It's easier to talk about an initiative to be more open than to, to try to ask them to agree to be more open. And it also allows us the option to allow um, individuals to be part of our community and be able to participate in this regardless of the position that their institution is at this time, especially people who um, really want to help their institution be more open to the idea of openness. Um, so our mission is really to, or, or our, our goal is really to increase the number of institutions in the United States that are willing to have conversations about animal research and be able to, to put that into context. And can you, next slide, please. Oh, oh did I figure it out? So our mission is to empower individuals and institutions. And um, our audience is you. So we're not actually the ones doing the public advocacy. We might be on behalf of our institutions, but together as, as, a, as a community, we're here to provide support to all of you to be able to then have those conversations with the public or be able to work with your institution to be able to develop a plan of openness, um, to be able to have these dialogues with various stakeholders within the public and within your institutions. Because we do find that even, um, I like the word that's been used in reach, we do find that you know, even having these dialogues within your institutions is really important because not everyone understands or appreciates why this has happened or even knows in some larger institutions that this that there's animal research happening. So our mission is to empower indiv individuals and institutions um, based on the principles of openness. And this includes building trust, supporting science, and countering misinformation and disinformation. And I think we all embrace this vision. This is the same vision of this workshop today. And that's a future where the public um, understands and supports and endorses even our, um, our work with, and 
the work, our work, and the important contributions that animals make to it, um, and understands that that we depend on animal studies only when there's no alternative. And I want to stress that point. So our people, it's um, a wonderful, wonderful group of volunteers who are doing all of the work. Um, we have over 125 now volunteers from industry, academia, government, and breeders. Um, and they, they comprise um, our steering group and then seven committees that are doing all of our work, um, working on our strategic plan and our, our mission and making sure we stay on track, um, helping us find those institutions that really exemplify the um, idea of openness and are doing and are really taking the lead on this and being able to provide platforms for these organizations to be able to talk about what they're doing, share their experiences and network with, with people who want to become more involved or want to, to mirror after them. Um, we have several groups working on how we communicate our mission um, through one pages, our website, our um, ambassadors who are out spreading our message, um, our openness survey, which is um, designed to help us track, um, get a, get the, the landscape of openness now and be able to track progress of openness as we continue our mission. Um, and then communications and our most recently added um, committee is our impacts and outcomes to be able to really put some metrics around what we're doing and making sure that we're having our intended impact. And this is meant to both, um, we want to track both the impact of um, organizational um, openness and how organization the, the methods that organizations are taking to be more open, but also our 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 individual efforts and our ability to talk um, on our own. So as I mentioned, this is an initiative. We want to be very, very inclusive. We want everyone to feel comfortable at whatever level they or the organization is at. And so we do have a statement of intent. Um, and by signing this, you're really, the, your organization is really just committing to our mission and that you wanna be part of the dialogue, you wanna be part of the community, and you wanna be part of discussing um, if we were to reach an agreement, what that would look like and if that's achievable. Um, so there, we, we don't want to have a, a very prescriptive um, agreement at this point, but we really want to have um, the opportunity for anyone who wants to be part of our community to be able to join. And so you can um, look, look up more on our website about our statement and intent and, and have your organization join. So we did our um, initial openness survey this year, and we presented some preliminary results at the National ALAS meeting, and we'll be um, presenting more comprehensive results um, sometime early next year in the next couple months that should be available. So I'm not gonna go into the details here, but I am gonna give you some examples of the various types of openness that we found in the survey. Um, several facilities, the, the number one type of example of openness that we found in the, in the surveys was facility tours, especially for or, um, affiliated uh, members of the of the organization, so non-animal staff, um, students, or family and friends of people affiliated with the organization, and then also legislators, um, and then some additional facilities. Some facilities were also adding additional people, such as the media um, and various members of the community. Presentation and educational events, um, public talks were another popular way, especially internally and for students to understand um, what's what their organization is doing and why it's important and the work that's being done with animals. Um, special events, Brad events, um, presence at community events, um, some organizations do like a, a, a booth or something at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an institutional uh, event to be able to talk about what they're doing, um, press releases and articles, and then um, sharing inspection reports and records and, and making that available. Okay, wrong way. So why is openness so important? And I think we all know why it's important. Um, and this is where I might pivot and just talk a little bit about some of my experience and some of the, the things that I've learned that have helped shape my experience and my perspective on how we can be open. Um, and lack of transparency equals lack of trust. And this is for all of society now. 
our um, generations, the millennials and Gen Z and those younger, they really expect more transparency. There is a plethora of information at our fingertips and gone are the days of, um, you know, the secret recipe or the secret sauce or, or, or proprietary methods. You know, several companies are now even using transparency as a competitive advantage and sharing everything from their resource planning and sustainable um, supply chains to how much they're paying their executives and that, that then they're they're using that to promote themselves and many um, people expect now many employees expect transparency from their employers and many consumers expect transparency from the companies they're buying from they don't want the sauce to be a secret they want to know what's in it they want to make sure it complies with their values they want to make sure it's healthy and so we don't really have a choice we have to really start talking about what we're doing and and giving the public that level of trust that they they expect to have from the institutions and the organizations that are part of society. Another piece that I think is really important is control of the narrative. And we have been allowing someone else to control how the public feels about what we do. We have not been the ones communicating our stories. And I'm going to tell you a little personal story. I told you before that I wrote a paper about against animal research when I was in high school. So I became interested in science as a kid when my brother was diagnosed with diabetes. I was only eight years old. And fortunately, it was 1991, so insulin had been around. We, you know, he had therapies, and my family got really involved with the um, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. So we were privy to all the ongoing, the pumps that were being developed that he now uses, and a lot of the new technology that was coming through. And I found it really fascinating and really important because it impacted my brother's life and our lives so much. And I always really had a passion for biology. And so that was, I studied biology all through high school and I had a, I had no idea that animals were involved in that the whole time that I was involved in, in learning about this stuff. And when I got to high school, I loved animals. I loved biology and I was to write a paper on a controversial topic and I wrote it on animal testing. And I had a very influential teacher who was very opposed to animal research, who helped me with this paper, helped direct me towards resources that I could use. And I was sold. I, I believed that, you know, with computer models and with tissue testing and cell testing, that we didn't need animals anymore and that, that it was highly unethical. And I very passionately presented this to my, to my classmates in high school. And I passionately believed this all through my undergraduate studying biology and studying zoology and, and anthropology and biological anthropology, I was against animal testing. And I got to graduate school and I started studying with some researchers who were working on some very, um, very um, severe diseases, deadly diseases, impactful diseases. And uh, most of the research, it was, an, it was a biological anthropology program. So most of the work that was being done was in humans, but there was a small subset that had to be done in animals. And I started to realize that everything that I thought I knew about animal research was completely wrong. And I think that, you know, going back to the survey and thinking about the difference with the level of education, it took me till graduate school to really get the truth about what's, and it took me seeing it firsthand. And fortunately, my lab, I worked in a lab, we worked with human tissues and human blood samples, but I was right across the hall from me attending that. And I got to know her really well and really started to understand the truth. And so lo and behold, I finished graduate school and I end up at Marshall Bioresources, one of the largest providers of non-animal um, or I'm sorry, non rodent animal models for research. And I started being able to go out and see research institutions from government to um, academia to, to pharma and CROs and realized how much the people working with these animals truly love them and how important this work is. And it was really eye opening. And I'm telling you the story because it shouldn't have taken me that long. I should have been able to during my now, granted, you know, it's been a while. Um, not to date myself, but it's been a couple decades since high school, but still, you know, there was someone else creating that narrative for me. And so I really think that we have to pay attention to how we're viewed and we have to stop letting somebody else tell that story for us. 
So where can we improve? These are some things that I've learned. So I started as a scientist, then I got to Marshall and then I started um, working with scientists to help explore how um, some of the animal models, pig models, ferret models, non-traditional models might fill some of the gaps. And so I went in there, you know, super excited, like, look at these models. They're great. Let me give you all the facts. And I was surprised that how, um, it wasn't working. People weren't just like, yay, that sounds great. Give me that fact sheet and we'll, uh, and we'll adopt that right away. And so I had to really kind of take a look at how I was communicating, even with scientists and understanding how to change minds, how to approach new ideas, um, to get that dialogue going. And so, I think somehow it like disconnects. So the biggest thing I learned is facts don't change hearts and minds. And I think we know that we all talked about that yesterday. We cannot erase emotion from the dialogue. People form their opinions and beliefs based on emotions, not facts. We are feeling beings before we are thinking beings. All of us, everyone in this room, everyone online, no matter how scientific and rational you want to think you are, we are all feeling beings. And a change to one's worldview can feel like an attack to their identity and cause them to feel threatened and to double down on their position. So anytime we're defensive, we actually might be pushing people away from us. And people choose to interact with people and media and stories that, conf that confirm their beliefs, that not those that challenge them. That's called confirmation bias. That's a real thing. Um, there's a Netflix special about it. Um, we have, unfortunately, we have algorithms that push social media towards us that confirm what we like. That's why we're getting so much information from social media, even though it's not a trusted source because it's confirming and validating our beliefs every time we log in because algorithms have already learned who we are. So we need to remember this, that when we're going into dialogues, when we're presenting information, that we can't go at it full strength, charge ahead. We have to understand that we will push people people away if we challenge what people's feelings and their beliefs are. So one of the ways that I've been able to really understand how to connect with people is through vulnerability, empathy, and compassion. And we talked a lot about empathy yesterday and having empathy for the person we're speaking with or the audience that we're speaking with. We also need to be able to create a space where they can have empathy for us. And the way that we can do that is through vulnerability. And vulnerability is exactly that. We're opening ourselves up and being vulnerable to a potential attack on what we do, to somebody potentially really not liking what we do. But that's the only way for them to really start to believe us and understand us and have empathy for us and eventually have compassion. And that's what we want. We want people to have compassion for what we're doing and compassion for the work that we're doing and believe in it and be able to support it when we need it. And one of the ways that I've had a lot of success in doing this is through circles, through team building circles. And um, it's exactly what you think. We sit in a circle, we have a talking piece, we go around, everyone gets a chance to speak if they'd like. We ask very pointed questions. Um, I've, had a, I've done this with several different types of organizations and several different groups within organizations. And it's a really great way when you're working with um, internal groups that um, animal care technicians, or um, veterinarians, different people that have um, various perspectives to be able to allow um, them to have a chance to speak with senior leadership. We've had CEOs join with animal care technicians or directors join. Um, and the two questions that always always are successful. So we'll ask a round of, of kind of get to know you questions and humanize each other. But then the two questions that always seem to have an impact is what do you like best about your role within your institution or your affiliation with this institution? And then, then everyone can talk about what they really like best. And then what's one thing you would change if you could to make things better or easier within this, this institution. And it's really a great way to help. People are always surprised at what the CEO often says because usually it's something like, I wish we had greater communication with the team or I wish we could do more. And, and the, the, the technicians, you know, it's also surprising because a lot of times it's, I wish we could do more for the animals. I wish we could do this. I wish we could do that. And it's a really a great way to help um, both 
to help whoever, whoever needs to see the other side's perspective. It's a great way to do that in a safe environment where everyone gets a voice and, and it's not, and it's not a, a head on, let's, let's have a, an argument. And so I'd love to do more of this if people are interested, because I think that there's some value here and I've had a lot of success in, in very different um, context with using with using circles. It's just a, an easy, safe way to start these dialogues. So the next slide is I love this metaphor. So I'm gonna I'm probably gonna butcher it. There's some resources here if you want to really look at it. But I think this is a great metaphor for understanding how we process information and change. And it's from Jonathan Hyde. He's a uh, social psychologist at NYU, and it's elephant and the rider. And we've talked about how we have an emotional brain and a logical brain, and we have to deal with both. And in this metaphor, the rider is the logical brain, the rational brain. It's got to direct where, where, where they're going. The elephant is the emotional brain. The elephant is bigger. It's unpredictable. It has its own agenda. It might not agree with the rider. It might resist the rider. How many times have we believed in something, but our emotions contradicted it, especially when going through change? So the idea is that we have to try to, when we're trying to implement change, we have to recognize that while we might get somebody to agree with us logically, emotionally, they might still be resistant. How can we get that emotional? How can we, you know, as Dr. Bennett talked about yesterday, how can we connect those dots? And I have found, and the research has backed me up, that there is one way, a stick or what do elephants eat, a, a branch with leaves that we can use to motivate the elephant, and that is validation. Everybody wants to feel validated. And I'm going to give you just a really quick example of validation um, in the context of research. And that could be if I'm talking to a stranger who doesn't know me, what do you do? Well, I work with diabetic pigs to study diabetes. And they said, oh, that's, that's really sad. That makes me sad. Oh, I'm, oh, what? Oh, no. I didn't mean to make you sad. Like, I'm sorry, that makes you sad. Can you tell me more about why that makes you sad? Well, just the idea of animals being made sick and suffering, that's just, I can't, that makes me really sad. Oh no, I can totally understand. That would make someone sad. Like that, that definitely, that's, that's terrible. Um, so can I talk to you a little bit about um, how we make sure that the animals stay healthy? and that they're not suffering with our work. So now I haven't pushed against them. They're allowed to feel sad. That's their feelings. They, their feelings need to be validated. And then I'm inviting them to come in on this journey with me instead of trying to push against them. And it is a dialogue. You know, I think we, we sometimes feel like we're in an inquisition and I just have to keep answering and keep answering and keep answering, but you can pause and stop and ask, can you tell me more about why you feel that way? Can you, can you help me understand, you know, what it is you think that's happening so that I can, share with you my experiences. Um, that's a great way to not be oppositional and a great way to really kind of empathize that they have people who don't know or have mis who have misinformation have really valid feelings and they need to be validated in order to feel heard and in order to then want to hear you. So I'm trying to wrap this up because I know I'm running out of time. Um, are we sharing the right stories with the right audiences? And uh, I like this little chart because it really um, talks about how we need to have the right combination of information and emotions. We need to tap into that emotional side of people. We need to create that empathy in order for them to really be compelled by what we're doing. Um, and. I do want to make the point of whose job is this? And we're scientists and we all think this is important, but we're all scientists and, you know, we, we, we're all, um, you know, experts in neurobiology and endocrinology. We're veterinarians. We've gone to school for, you know, eight, 10 years. And now we have to become experts in communication and storytelling too. Like this is a lot. We're asking a lot. And so I think we need to recognize that there is a lot of, of, people that can help and that this is an organizational and, a, and an industry initiative. This is not something that we can do on our own and that we need to help engage with the right stakeholders. We need to have conversations about who else needs to be in the room um, because I applaud everyone here and everyone online who is learning about this and who is, is stepping up to talk about it because you're already an expert and now you're trying to be a secondary expert and that's amazing and that means you really believe in what you're doing um, and there's others that need to be supporting us as well. So in summary, this is a shared responsibility organizationally and, and, and 
and industry-wide, um, we need to remember that we're all emotional beings and we need to be including that emotion and not just facts. We need to take control of our narrative. It's our narrative. We need to be in control of it. We need to be telling our stories. We need to do that with transparency and we need to build trust. And we're not alone. The USARO initiative is here. We're not having to reinvent the wheel, every single one of us. We can do this together as an industry and share with each other and learn from each other and be able to tell our stories together. So that is the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, would you would you mind elaborating a little bit uh, regarding the U.S. Animal Research Openness Initiative? Um, we heard yesterday from Dr. Allison Bennett that uh, we could we could argue that the United States um, is very very transparent, uh, probably a leader in that area, um, and in fact the way our the animal research here in the United States is governed, um, the public can get a lot of information about that work that happens. Um, and so can, can you talk about how, how the initi USARO initiative sort of, um, you know, complements that or, you know, what is it that that initiative would a, a help the public be able to um, understand or get uh, that's not already available through uh, public request systems? That's a great question. So um, that's very true. We, as, as Dr. Bennett said, we're one of the most open um, countries in the world in terms of um, what's available, especially for our public institutions. Um, one of the issues is that it's, it's only available if you're looking for it. So one of the things that the USARO can do now, as it, open as we want to be, we can put the information on our websites, we can put it on our social media, we can get that information out there. But if it's not in front of the audiences that need to hear it, it's only going to go to those who are looking for it. And so we need to inspire the right audiences to either come to us looking for it, or be able to get it to them so that they can find it. So that's one of the challenges is that pretty much anyone can find anything they want, even with public institutions. I mean, even, even, or I'm sorry, even with private institutions that are regulated by the USDA, there's a lot of information you can find about a, a private institution as well. Um, but unless you know where to look, unless you're going to look for it, it's hard to find it or it's not in the forefront of your mind and you're not thinking about it until, um, until something comes up that makes you question what's going on. And so one of the goals of this initiative is to really help us find ways to get the right platforms, to reach the right audiences, to interact more with um, media, more with our communities and being able to do outreach so that it's, it's, it's front and center. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so it sounds like um, one of the one of the benefits is really being able to put context to what's already out there. Exactly. Um, how can um, somebody, you know, an institution or even an individual, learn more about, um, you know, openness efforts that are already happening? You know, so one of the wonderful things um, that we see in the United States is there are a lot of institutions that are doing great things in openness. So is there a way that someone might be able to learn more about what others might be doing? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. So if you would like to learn more about what our exemplars are doing, you can go to usaro.org and we have a whole page dedicated to exemplars. We are also working very hard to provide um, opportunities at National ALAS and other um, meetings where um, exemplar giving platform for exemplars to speak, um, doing webinars. So I highly encourage if you're interested in learning more about the exemplars and the work that the US Hero is doing, please visit the website, sign up to be um, involved and um, check out the exemplars page and what they're doing and reach out to those organizations because they've agreed they want to talk about what they're doing. They want to share their stories. So, so reach out to those organizations that are there and, and, and start asking your questions and seeing if, if you can um, learn from what they're doing. Awesome. So we have a question that came in and we are ahead of schedule, so oh. <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, so the question is, can you reshare the, the quad chart about the info and information for sharing the right stories with the right audience? You didn't spend a lot of time on that slide. So could we go back to that slide? 
Sure. Um, and, and, and share that. And then if there's an, if, if there's a few more words you wanted to say about that, that would be great. Absolutely. Could we get the presentation back up? So this is really just, I mean, this is very simplified, but this really breaks down. So how, when you're telling a story, this is for any story, whether you're talking about work with animals or whether you're just telling a story, creative writing, that um, the balance between information and emotion. So obviously if there's no information and there's no emotion, it's an incredibly boring story and you're probably not gonna get anybody interested in that. If there's a lot of information, but not a lot of emotion, it's a fact-based story. Um, and we as scientists, we like facts-based stories. We read research articles all the time. We like when there's a, not a lot of bias interjected. So that's actually one of our challenges because we're all taught to write academically. I mean, I say, still use APA when I'm writing like a story <laughs> because that's just how I learned how to, how to write. So, so um, you know, we're familiar with fact-based stories. We resonate with it because we're scientists and we like to use information. Our emotions are informed by facts. Facts and we're still emotional, but that 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 we use those facts. Um, that's part of our personalities. But that's um, not everyone. Um, a lot of people. I had a I had the opportunity to have a great mentor who was not in the industry at all, and he had a background in creative writing, and he um, was very very candid with me. And I would write things, and he would be like, no nobody cares about this. He's like, get it down. 10 words. You have 10 words, get it down to 10 words. And, and you know, how, I don't feel anything from this. This tells me nothing. Great. You guys did this. What, what does that mean for me as the reader? And I had to do a lot of learning about how to, um, how to really engage somebody who isn't as excited about the research as I am and who isn't, isn't directly involved. And so that's where you get into the emotions and playing into um, people's vulnerabilities, your own vulnerabilities, like being vulnerable, you know, talking about your own feelings about it. Um, really, you, you'd think it's counterintuitive, but it's not. I mean, people appreciate that. People appreciate that you have feelings about what you're doing. And even if it's like, I, I might say, you know, like, well, do the animals, you know, even if they say, do the animals have to be killed? I might say they do um, sometimes. And that can be tough if you have a bond with them, but also I, I'm okay with it because, you know, the animals don't feel any pain. It's exactly the same as, as when you take your animal to the vet and the, the, the data we get out of it is so important towards what we're doing. And these animals have a great life up until it. So honestly, I'm okay with that. And it doesn't, you know, it's more important to me that I spend my time making sure that the animals have this amazing life and that their time here and the sacrifice they're making is, you know, they feel like they had a great life and they were never in pain. And so if they have to end in euthanasia, that that's something I'm okay with. Like even that's being vulnerable because people might not agree with me and that's okay. They're allowed to, but that at least allows us to have a dialogue. So, you know, opening up and, and sharing your own feelings about um, where you maybe are uncomfortable or where you're not uncomfortable or where you're maybe uncomfortable with not being uncomfortable. Um, at least that, that starts to bring more, a more compelling story, a more human story to what you're telling, you know, and a story that's full of all emotions is very entertaining. And that's a great way to, that's propaganda, honestly. Um, so if you can, you know, mix emotions with proper, accurate information, you can really provide a compelling story. And so that's really what this, this picture is trying to say is that, um, you know, you have to have the right balance in order to really provide a compelling story that's going to reach people and, and resonate with them. Thank you. We heard yesterday the importance of developing our own elevator pitch or our own story. So those are great tips. Um, and, and one more question. Um, with regard to transparency, we find that some opponents to animal research use this shared information out of context to shift the narrative. So what are some suggestions to promote transparency while preventing this issue? That's a really, really, really great question. And that's a, a, a really important problem is, is using the information out of context. And I think 
I don't have an easy answer for this because I think if there was an easy answer, we would have done it a long time ago. Um, I think the best that we can do is to continue to provide the full story and make sure that that, that information is available. Um, making sure that we have the context readily available. So, you know, put it, posting your USDA inspection reports on your website is great. And I fully encourage it, make it, it's, they can find it. Anybody who wants it can find it. So make it easy for somebody to find it. But the great thing is you then are able to put the additional context around it, be able to explain why something happened, if there is a finding in there and be able to um, talk about what you did. And I, I think also the other piece of it is getting ahead of things. So being really sharing the story before somebody else gets to it. So if you did have something happen, if you can talk about it first, be able to say this happened and either we were, we, we were surprised we, or this happened, this is why we were working on it. We hadn't quite solved the solution. Here's where we're at now. We're gonna keep you updated or this is completely solved. Being able to put that out there first and being able to say, this is what happened. This is what we did. It's out there. Now you, there isn't really a leg to stand on and they can't say, look, they're doing these horrible things. Look, it's on their USDA report. Yeah, but if I go to their website, it explains exactly what happened and exactly who was involved in what they did about it, that the, you know, that the attending veterinarian was involved and, and that they, they address this issue and it, it actually makes sense why it happened and it's a normal occurrence. And, and you know, sometimes animals might, you know, get into a fight, they're animals. Sometimes they get annoyed with their roommate, just like we do. So, you know, sometimes things happen and they're normal and they're natural. And it's, and it's, and it's, we, if we can tell that story first, it, it'll help because then it's not a gotcha moment. Then it's a, look, they had this problem. Yeah. And look, they told us why. So that, that would be my one recommendation is that, you know, putting that context out there first, then it makes it harder to take it out of context because you are, it's, it's obvious you're fabricating a story if the context is, is, was already available. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and here's um, just asking for some advice. A lot of times when we're talking about the animals that are involved in research, we often say that they're purpose bred for research. Um, and somebody is asking, is there a better way to sort of say that? Uh, this, this requester is saying, you know, some will equate that to just like food. Uh, animals are raised for food. Um, so I don't know. Is there, is there a certain way that you address um, purpose-bred animals for research or where the animals come from for, for research? Yeah, that's a fantastic question because within the research industry, that means a lot because, you know, I think nowadays everyone's using um, class A breeders and, 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 and animals that were bred for research, but there was a time when this was really important. Um, so purpose-bred is really industry jargon. So it's one of those things where when you're talking to the public, um, it doesn't mean anything. So yes, I think one of the ways, you know, I would say that these animals were bred and raised and reared for life in a laboratory um, and working with dogs, that's a big deal. So I would explain when I would be talking about the dogs, you know, that these dogs are purposely raised in an environment where they're used to being um, handled, they're used to being in kennels, they're used to being exposed to different procedures, different people being around them, so that when they're in a laboratory, they're perfectly content and happy. And I can tell you from experience, because I took one home, that they are perfectly content and happy, and I almost regretted it. At first, I thought I made a terrible mistake because he was so overwhelmed with what do I do in a house? I'm used to being in a kennel. So they are happy. They are adjusted to this environment. So that's one of the ways is, you know, think of it like a working dog, that these animals have been um, conditioned and reared to be happy and content and not stressed in this environment and stressing that the not stressed part is important. We don't want to do research and stressed animals that have high cortisol levels. So I will emphasize that when I'm talking to people that it's really critical that the animals are calm and happy and um, relaxed because if there aren't, if they're stressed and anxious, that's going to really skew our data. And we don't want that. That's bad science. Um, and that can help. But I would say, you know, words like purpose bred, that's industry jargon. Even things like minimize pain and distress, that's industry jargon. That, I mean, if I say, oh, I, we do a lot to minimize pain and distress, what do you mean minimize pain and distress? Are you, 
minimizing how much pain and distress you're putting them in? Are you making sure they have minimal pain and distress? Like even these kinds of things, we there's a lot that we take for granted because we're just so used to it and we're so used to the jargon that are very questionable to people. And that's another area where you can try to um, make it a dialogue and say things like, does that make sense? Or do you understand what I mean by that? And really help, um, you know, we talked about mirroring yesterday and, and really helping to like pause for a moment and say, am I making sense? Is this, is this something that makes sense to you? Because I might be taking that for granted. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your advice and your presentation. And I think we're gonna move on to the panel. All right, thank you everyone. Are the other ones online already? The other presenters are online. We're ready to go? Perfect. All right. So we are ready to start our session number eight, considerations along the spectrum of openness. Um, myself, Crystal Johnson, and Paula um, Clifford will be moderating this session. And this session object objective is to showcase the many considerations to keep in mind as an institution determines for itself the appropriate level of openness about scientific research involving animals. We have several amazing panelists that will be participating. Um, Kristen Layton, Jim Newman, Wendy Jarrett, and Eva Masiajewski. And I'll give a short bio for each one of them, and then we'll begin with the um, panel discussion. So Christine Layton is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Science, and she joined Louisiana State University faculty in 2018. Her research examines hormones, the brain, and behavior in wild sunbirds, in part to better understand the impacts of stress on humans and wildlife. Um, Dr. Layton's current work focuses on three areas, the neurobiology of neophobia, the effects of climate change on sibling competition, and the interactions between the immune system and the stress response. Jim Newman serves as the Director of Strategic Communications for Americans for Medical Progress, where he leads AMP's media and communications program. He also assists with AMP's extensive public education efforts. Prior to joining AMP as an employee, Jim served on the organization's board of directors for several years. And in the past, Jim was the director of external communications for the University of Texas MD Anderson um, and the director of media relations for Oregon's Health and Science University at Oregon and Oregon's National Primate Research Center. Wendy, Wendy Jarrett has been Chief Executive of Understanding Animal Research, the UK's Animal Research Advocacy Organization since 2012. She led the development of the Concordia and on openness on animal research in the UK and worked with colleagues across Europe to set up the European Animal Research Association in 2014. In 2022 and 2023, she worked with colleagues in Australia and New Zealand to create UAR Oceana. Um, Wendy is the vice chair of the UK Home Office Animals and Science Committee. 
And last but not least is Eva. She is the Director of Communications and Media Relations at the Foundation for Biomedical Research. FBR is a 501c3 um, nonprofit organization established in 81 to promote public understanding and support for responsible and necessary animal research. Eva has been FBR's Director of Communication and Media Relations since July of 2019. So let's welcome our panelists and we're ready to get started. Okay, I think um, I was gonna go first. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. I've got, uh, oh, okay. It says it, it, won't, it won't let me share my screen. <laughs> um, Okay, there we go, thank you. Um, okay, let's see. All right, so um, thank you everyone for um, your attendance today and thank you for that introduction. Um, as Crystal mentioned, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at LSU. Um, and my research is really focused on understanding how physiology neurobiology and behavior help wild animals successfully cope with um, environmental challenges, which can be anything from predators to disease. And, um, you know, my own experience dealing with uh, anti-animal research activism started back in 2017 when I was still a postdoc at Yale University. And um, basically in March of that year, I was approached by a Yale undergrad, uh, Mary Chukwu, you can see here in the uh, in the author line. And she was a, a writer for a really wonderful student publication at Yale that's called the Yale Scientific Magazine. Um, Mary wanted to interview me about some research that I was doing using um, computed tomography, CT scans, which is the sort of biomedical imaging technique that's also used in people. Um, and we were studying body composition in wild birds in response to captivity stress using CT scans. So we did the interview um, and it appeared in the April edition of the magazine. So you can see here, April 6th, 2017. Well, just about a month later, um, uh, there was a Yale sociology student who I never met and um, never interacted with, whose name was Han Wen. And she graduated and went to go work for PETA. And that is when um, there was a harassment campaign against me that started. And so you can see starting in about May, um, there were, you know, articles on PETA's uh, website about me. There started to be some protests, email campaigns, things like that. As far as I can tell, Han probably saw this Yale Scientific Magazine article about me and brought it to PETA, or it's possible that PETA just, you know, knew that they had this Yale alumna who's working for them and they saw it as an opportunity to do more um, campaigns at Yale and they found the article themselves but regardless it you know it's just one of these things right it was kind of wrong place at the wrong time um, and that was I think how it all started so when I first started getting you know these angry emails and social media posts um, against you know the research that I was doing um, I was I was pretty surprised and and upset. You know, I wanted to kind of speak out and defend myself and the work that we were doing, but um, I got advice that you know, hey, this is you know kind of a crisis situation. With crisis management, often the response is, okay, just put your head down, wait for it to blow over. Um, I had never dealt with anything like this before, and so I that that was what I did, um, and it didn't help, right? So the harassment continued. And in, in actually, in fact, it may have even gotten a little bit worse in terms of just the volume of protests, emails, messages on social media and things like that. And because I'm a scientist, I was like, okay, well, the keep your head down and wait for it to blow over approach, like that, that isn't working. Um, let's try something else. And so then, you know, I reached out to some really helpful uh, scientists who had dealt with harassment themselves, you know, also started talking to people from groups like speaking of research in the UK and some of the folks from Americans for Medical Progress. Um, and then with their encouragement, I started doing what, what I really had wanted to do from the beginning, which was to speak out about, okay, here's what I'm actually doing. Um, and so, you know, you can see here, 
okay, I started talking to um, reporters. This, you know, on the left here, this is a, a, an article that appeared in Science, where I talked to David Grimm uh, about about you know the whole campaign and about what my work was really about. Um, you know, I started um, posting on on Twitter, and you can see here. This was an article from um, IFL Science that you know, I didn't actually talk to a journalist there, but they were sort of following my um, following my campaign. And you can sort of see, like, I started saying, like, okay, here's 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 what I'm going to say about my research on Twitter. And then, you know, yeah, I've I've you know, when people have asked me to appear on podcasts and talk about my work and and also about the harassment, I'm happy to do that. Um, what, you know, um, I also, you know, one of the things I've also done is published my own pieces, right? So I, I've published, you know, there was something that I published at Yale about animal research myths and reality that appeared on their uh, postdoctoral association webpage. And, and then, you know, when I started here at LSU, I also published a letter to the editor, just sort of, you know, here's, here's what I do, here's why it's important, right? Um, and a huge, um, a huge effort that I made was to um, really kind of go through my professional webpage and, you know, I'll be honest and say initially my professional webpage had been full of scientific jargon and wasn't communicating, I think, very clearly about, you know, exactly how I was using animals and why I was using animals in the work that I was doing. Um, and so I really rewrote a lot of my website and, and, you know, you can, if you want to see more details, like here's the QR code and here's the URL and you can kind of check those out for yourselves. Um, and really tried to use more accessible language, directly talking about, you know, the purpose and the benefits of our work and, um, you know, exactly the types of things that we're doing with animals and why. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think I'm the most proud of and I think has really been the most effective is this uh, FAQ page about animal research that we have. Um, and you can see, again, a QR code here in the URL. And you know, really try to address kind of point by point, like here are some, here are some questions that I've gotten from journalists as well as in emails and, and, you know, sort of talking points that I've seen about my work um, and, you know, try to, try to address these things. And I, and I do know from looking at um, visitation data that this is actually one of the most visited parts of my website. So I know people are looking at this um, and, you know, I will say, you know, the harassment campaigns have continued, but in terms of the volume of harassment and the tone of the messages that I've that I've gotten over time, um, these have really dramatically shifted. So I do think that, you know, talking to journalists, being more open um, on my webpage, and kind of even specifically addressing these types of um, frequently asked questions, I think these things have been really helpful. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, and I really think that a big part of it is that, you know, when someone reads something awful um, that has been written about me or said in a podcast or whatever, they can Google me and they also now see what I have to say and what journalists have to say. And, you know, in some cases, what my colleagues have said, speaking out to support me, and they, they can see that there's two sides to this story, right? And they can sort of try to weigh those weigh those two sides for themselves. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of my presentation. I just wanted to do a, a really brief overview of, of my own story and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about it. We're gonna hold all questions to the end. Thank you, Christine. We'll have Jim up next. Okay, let me just load up my slides here. And just let me know if you don't see anything here. Uh, very brief intro. I mean, I already had one again. Um, communications director for Americans for Medical Progress with some a lot of past work in biomedical research, specifically in academia. Most recent stop was MD Anderson Cancer Center, but um, the majority of my comments today will be based on my experiences in Oregon, and that's where I was the director of communications, both for the university hospital and health system, but also for the research venture. And that included the Oregon National Primate Research Center. I actually served as the director of communications for that center as well for many years. Um, I loved it. Uh, it was something that I literally spent part of my week out there every single week. And it was um, one of the best parts of my job. 
Uh, so again, a lot of my comments today will be focused on those those years and those experiences. Um, so speaking of Oregon Health and Science University, um, I wanted to share a little bit about how we sort of um, followed what what Christine just just went through as she talked about how her thinking had sh uh, shifted based on the experiences she she underwent. And uh, that's exactly what happened uh, at, at an institutional level at, level at Oregon Health and Science University is, and that event occurred in August 2000. Um, and I'm not going to say that we were never targeted by animal rights groups before that. We actually were, of course, most institutions are. Before that, we had occasional protests and some disruption, event disruptions, but there were no sustained campaigns. It wasn't something we dealt with on a weekly basis or even a monthly basis. It just happened once in a while, sort of standard for a, an, a research facility that studies both humans and animals. Uh, things shifted uh, pretty drastically in August 2000, and that's when we were we learned that we had been infiltrated by an animal rights group. And um, it sort of followed the typical pattern is lots of allegations. In this case, the our infiltrator actually himself spoke out and talked about his work there, uh, provided a lot of images and video and things like that. And as a result of that infiltration, there was a tremendous amount of activity, um, significant increase in uh, protests, on-site protests. I think the first protest we witnessed right after the infiltration was announced was over 100 people. That wasn't typical for us. Normally, it was five to 10 people that would protest uh, outside our facilities. Uh, we had these long-term sustained campaigns uh, by, by a variety of groups. Uh, you know, and, and as for tactics and what we experienced, uh, and I should mention, um, really important to note that there was a USDA inspection, of course, and we were, we applauded that. And the USDA ended up clearing the primate center. However, it was about a three or four month period between when the allegations were first made and, and you know, during the investigation, et cetera. So there's that gap in time where the public sort of were, was hearing all of these negative things about the primate center and frankly, hearing very little from us. And that was a problem. Uh, so what did we experience as a result of that campaign? Well, certainly countless protests. It was sort of a, it wasn't a weekly thing, but it felt like every single month or maybe a couple times a month we had a protest, either at our facility or sometimes outside of our hospital. Even one time I remember they protested outside of our emergency department, which is, you know, not exactly the best place to protest when you have ambulances coming in and out, et cetera. Uh, we had two ALF attacks. Two scientists had their homes vandalized in one in one instance, um, two two. Uh, two cars were vandalized. There's a picture right there of one. In another case, a uh, scientist's um, garage door was spray painted. Uh, we had regular instances of home harassment. And when I mean regular, I mean every single Sunday. You could set your clock by it. We would experience harassment at individual scientists' homes, normally three or four scientists in one single day. They travel from one to the other. It was sort of this cat and mouse game they were playing with police. So we had a system that we set up to deal with that. Um, we had a, a blockade that closed our primate center, well, closed access to our primate center for an entire day uh, one at one period. And we had construction going on. So a, a, a cement mixer full of cement, um, basically the cement hardened and, and um, did some significant damage there. Uh, we had several event disruptions. Those were very common. We did a, a speaker series where we would feature scientists, um, animal scientists, human scientists, et cetera. And sometimes in this darkened theater, somebody would stand up and start screaming, which is if you're in a theater like that, it's a pretty terrifying thing. Uh, we had a lot of that. We had uh, extensive records requests, very commonplace. And of course, I, I'm a, I'm a, by trade, I am a journalist. I, of course, recognize the need for transparency, especially when we're talking about federal funding, et cetera. Uh, but you know, we had some very, very large ones that we had to deal with. Uh, we had legislative challenges. Uh, animal activists were going to our, our state house and um, trying to get legislation that uh, impacted us. Animal rights marches, billboards, banner drops, et cetera. Sometimes the billboards would sort of target our staff. Often you'll see that is that it won't necessarily target the public, but this, this is a billboard that was put up near our primate center. Uh, certainly media campaigns, very commonplace. And then a lot of other kind of attention grabbing um, actions, very similar to, I think, what, what Christine experienced at her institutions, but every, every institution that becomes a primary target sort of goes through this. So, you know, at one point we realized we can't continue to operate this way. We'd sort of done what, what Christine's institutions thought, right? We, it's a typical crisis. Keep your head down; it'll blow over, you know, or or you know, speak minimally, provide some expertise, and then hopefully it'll die down. Well, of course, it never does, and and those who are opposed to animal research often recognize that institutions will stay quiet, and so they sort of take advantage of that. They want to sort of create the narrative themselves, and I think that's a real as, as a communicator, that's a real 
really bad, uh, not only strategy, but also just a bad outcome. So what did we do? Our institution, we first, we reorganized our, our research communications. We created a new position that was specifically in charge of communications about animal research. I was actually not the first person that held that role. I was the second. Uh, but that person was given a tremendous amount of power and the, and the ability to work very quickly and respond with a moment's notice and also be an expert in that area. We expanded our uh, news coverage of breakthroughs. We'd always announced breakthroughs, but we made sure that we were very clear about the role of animals in research. Uh, we certainly did a lot more internal communications. Our primate center is on a, was on a, or still is on a different campus than the main campus. So letting our own employees know what we're doing, why we're doing it. Uh, what do we do to make sure animals are, are well cared for? Uh, we increased, uh, certainly increased morale at our center by by trying to get our, our staff more involved and, and featuring them. One thing I'm very, tremendously proud of is that a lot of the stories we would do were focused on our, our animal efforts. So uh, they used to, um, you know, put um, pumpkins in the, our outdoor corrals for the monkeys kind of on a regular basis. We did a lot of other things like that. But I started asking, can we start inviting the public to these things? Or can we start inviting the press to these things? Because they're really cool and people should be able to see this. So we started to do that. Uh, we've always done tours, but we expanded the the number of tours we did. Um, we did tours, for the as I mentioned, more tours for the public, more employee engagement events. Uh, you know, we really wanted the public to understand us. Um, and what we were doing and, and be able to ask questions, but we wanted to be the ones sort of telling that story and not allowing others to do that for us. Um, so this, this sort of strategy, uh, first of all, we knew it was working, but it sort of, it was really put to a test uh, uh, several years later. Our, our first infiltration, as you remember, was approximately 99, uh, 1999, 2000. The second one came in 2007. And um, we had been doing all of this work in the meantime, tours, media outreach, you know, inviting the press and et cetera. So as a result of that second infiltration, we saw a very drastic difference between how the public treated us. First of all, coverage was incredibly balanced. Now, I will say that we were, you know, when we found out we'd been infiltrated a second time, we said, come on in, talk to us, ask any questions. Huge panel of experts um, answered any questions the public may have. Uh, but the, the initial stories and the stories throughout were incredibly, um, I would say positive for us because, um, we, we were given a fair shake. We were able to defend ourselves, show our own videos, demonstrate what we were up to. Um, unlike the incident in, in 2000 where that literally I spent years of my life try, or many of us did, but many of us spent years of our lives defending ourselves from those allegations back in 2000. This time around, the story sort of evaporated very quickly within days. People stopped asking about it. They felt comfortable with the answer we'd given, the information we'd provided. Uh, the center morale was much better. Staff felt like we this time came up and defended them. And I don't think we did a very good job of that the first time around. Uh, one of the the way the reasons why that morale was higher is we get people involved. I remember one of the allegations was really awful. We had an employee with a, a hand injury that she, she had nerve damage and uh, activists had accused her of giving shots to animals using that damaged hand. And so we had her at the press conference, not, not with an animal, but demonstrate how she would give a shot with her other hand. And, and, you know, it was really a personal attack and, and she was more than happy to sort of respond to that. Um, the, you know, there was this feeling that our administration was supporting the staff and, and on the side, a couple of images there, where this was a landing page that we set up or every time new information would come forward, we put that on that page. One of the things that we were very tremendously proud about is a, uh, an, an editorial that was actually written by the newspaper coming to our defense. When they looked at all the data before them, they felt like the allegations here did not hold up under scrutiny. And we thought that was incredibly beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. Um, so the lessons learned, um, and I'm going to talk about proactive communications, lessons learned and reactive communications, lessons or proactive communications, things you do yourself, things, you know, your programs, your outreach, et cetera. And reactive is all responding to often crisis type situations. So our proactive communications lessons learned was that we needed to think both externally and internally. Uh, too many institutions only think about public perception. They don't think about how their own staff is, is um, dealing with this. How, how are their scientists feeling when they're attacked, like like Christine Latin has been and others have been, many others have been. Uh, how are the your, your animal care people who sort of become invisible in all of this? How do they feel when the institution uh, is, is not really responding um, uh, intensely to allegations? Uh, you know, we, we started thinking about all the different audiences, legislative, public, neighbors, et cetera, and, and making sure that we were talking to all those people uh, in different venues. 
uh, re recognizing that our employees are our strongest ambassadors, the people who are working with animals. Sometimes the, often they're sort of faceless. You know, people don't get to meet the, the people who care for animals, the veterinarians, the, the animal care technicians, uh, the scientists who talk at length about their work with animals. And so we sort of took the mask off those people and said, hey, these are the people that do this work. They are good people who care very much about what they do. Uh, we we made sure that all levels of the in, in, uh, organization were involved in our uh, our efforts, our proactive efforts, and also our responsive efforts. We had legal, security, communications, um, you know, briefing our top administrators, et cetera, getting our IACUC involved. Uh, we wanted to um, make it sure that employees knew that we had an open door. If they had any concerns, if they felt like you know, we were, weren't doing enough, tell us. Um, we certainly talked to them about, hey, do you want to be featured? We're going to have media coming in. Are you comfortable with being on camera if that happens? Uh, and then some reactive communications lessons learned. Um, for, certainly one thing is have a response plan ready. Have a, Build this into your crisis plan or create your own plan for dealing with significant allegations or infiltrations. Those are um, things that all institutions should consider. Uh, certainly, in one really important lesson learned is informing staff before others about negative events. If something bad happens, make sure your employees are aware and they have a right to ask questions. It's it's never fun. I've been I've worked in other venues, not in research, where I've learned about major changes as an organization by reading the paper, and that's never a fun way to learn about your your employment or your employer uh, is through that. And then uh, communicate rapidly and and remove barriers. As we all, all of us, a lot of us work in, or have worked in either academia or in a business setting. And we all know that the bigger the the, inst the institution, the facility, the sort of the slower the communications can go and get the approval process. And that needs to be removed to effectively communicate in situations like that. You know, uh, Christine had some great examples of, of talking to reporters and writing things on her own. And, and so she had that ability to quickly respond. And institutions need to do that as well. The communication staff needs to be able to respond. If they're asked a question, they know it's false, say right away, hey, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to provide you information. That's not true. Here's what we do. Um, you know, Be able to, to react very quickly because you may have 20 minutes. You may have one hour. Uh, you don't have days and days like you used to in, in the old media style. So uh, I believe that's the end of my slides and I'm gonna pass it on to our next presenter. Thanks, Jim. Wendy? Um, yeah, I just need to, there we go, uh, share what I'm doing. There we are, can you see that? No, not yet. Okay. Um, I am apparently sharing, but you can't see it. No, maybe stop sharing mm -hmm. and reshare. Yeah. Um, apparently, Jim's still sharing. I cannot share while the other participant is sharing. Yeah, I already I did stop sharing. I don't know why it's showing that. Try it again. That's looking a bit more promising now. There, is that working? Yep. Yeah. Great. Yes. Excellent. So, um, thank you very much. So, I'm just going to talk about the UK experience of openness, and this is for us really focused around our Concordat on Openness on Animal Research in the UK, which was published in May 2014 as a result of public opinion polling that showed that 40% of the UK population said that they needed, they felt they needed more information before they could make up their minds about animals in research. And so we created the Concordat, which is based around four commitments to being more open. People, organizations sign it as an organizational level. And we currently have a 126 participant organizations, signatory organizations from right across the spectrum. So you've got lots of universities, but also commercial organizations, pharmaceutical companies, funders, charities, and um, learned societies. And what we've seen in the UK over the last 10 years is a real step change in the amount of information and the quality of information and the type of information that's available for the public. So um, these are just a handful of web pages from Concordat signatories. And the point here that I'd like to make is that they all involve imagery. They all involve 
photographs of the reality of how animals are used and cared for in animal research facilities. Some organizations also provide videos. So this is from Cambridge University's website, and it's one of the various videos that they have on their website about this one in particular is the use of marmosets in research into OCD. The other sorts of information that people can get now that they couldn't get before is the statistics about animal research. And more than 50 organizations are now providing this sort of information on their website. This is from Oxford University, and it shows the species of animals that they've used in the previous year, the number of those animals they've used, but also the level of harm that those animals experienced. So for, as you see on the, on the left-hand side there, from non-recovery type experiments through mild, moderate, severe, and also the number of animals uh, used in research that was sub-threshold, so it didn't even reach the, the level of mild um, suffering. And as I say, we now have about, well, it's more than 50 organizations, I think, that do this, maybe 60 this year, whereas before the Concordat, nobody was providing this information for the public. We've also created a online tour so that people, in, in an ideal world, you'd take the whole population to see the inside of an animal research facility for themselves so that they could make up their own minds. But that's just not feasible. So we have a labanimaltour.org, which is the, the URL for that tour. And it gives you the opportunity to look into five UK establishments and you, you navigate yourself around those tours and there's information, videos, photographs, extra uh, information available for you to access during that tour. I haven't in five minutes got time to show you all the media coverage that's um, been generated since the Concordat, but this is just a couple of examples from national newspapers where the public, and this is from a newspaper, the Sun newspaper, which is not a very high brown newspaper, it's really aimed at our target audience of, of the general public that isn't terribly science literate. And it provides, as you can see, lots of information um, and photographs and the reality of how animals are used. And just another one other example of uh, photographs showing animals that have been used in research into paralysis. Each year we publish a report, a progress report on the Concordat. And this is the latest one that's just been published and you can find it on our website. But interestingly here, this is just some, we, we produce a big infographic as part of the report each year. But this shows you that one of the most, in, most popular subjects for signatories to communicate with the public about is around the, air, around the three R's. So the reduction, refinement, replacement of the use of animals in research. That's something that people are really interested in and that signatories want to tell people about. But you can also see there the numbers of signatories engaging in, in different ways of communicating with the public. And these are just some other statistics of how people have communicated internally um, and also externally providing information online. Um, so it's, yes, it's 63 signatories provided details on the number and species of animals used in their institution. And this has been really popular. Um, people did wait and see how it went in the UK first, but there are now 10 openness agreements, transparency agreements, um, mainly in Europe, but also in Australia and New Zealand. And as we've been hearing soon, there will be a similar um, agreement in the US. By having our openness agreement, we haven't stopped the fact that there are campaigns against the use of animals research in the UK. But what has changed is the, the, the way that people have responded to those campaigns. And so what you have here is on the top left hand side, there is a, an ongoing campaign against the use of dogs in research and breeding dogs for that research. And this is photography provided by that, that facility that's under attack, if you like. Um, to show the reality of how those animals live in their facility, something that, that just wouldn't have happened before the Concordat. There was that sort of put your head down and pretend it'll go away, but now people are coming out and providing the information. Another campaign is against the use of the forced swim test. So on the bottom left, you have the uh, a fact sheet that we produced with three other learned societies in the UK to explain where the forced swim test is useful and where it really shouldn't be used. And on the right-hand side of this slide, 
This is a letter that was published in the Times newspaper in the summer of 2021. And this was in August when everyone was on holiday, but we still managed to pull together, I think it's 17 other organizations that were willing to come join with us and write a letter to, the, to a national newspaper calling for support for the facility that was being campaigned against. Public opinion in the UK remains relatively high. Um, the acceptance of the use of animals in research and that's the word we use, it's acceptance, not do you like it, do you want it, do you want more of it? It's can you accept the use of animals in research? And as you can see, it's it's still at around 68%. The last time this was measured, which unfortunately hasn't been since 2018. But what we did note, what we were seeing in 2018 was as well as that 68% saying that they could agree um, with the statement that they could accept the use of animals in research as long as it complies with the law, as long as there's no unnecessary suffering and there's no alternative. What we were what we were seeing was that the public were feeling that animal research facilities were becoming less secretive. So the number who thought animal research facilities were secretive was dropping, and the percentage of the public that felt well informed, not just informed, but well informed about animal research in the UK was slowly rising. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Eva? Thank you. Um, if you could pull up my slides, I have a few slides too. Great. So I'm going to talk about, um, as we engage in the U.S. Openness Initiative, some key uh, strategies, strategic approaches to succeed um, in this new process. For one, and I think uh, this has already been emphasized yesterday with our presentation um, from Drs. Newsom and, and Thompson Iritani uh, with polling, that it is important uh, for us as we engaged in increasingly open communication to be aware of obviously public opinion trends um, on animal research. It's also important to closely follow both positive and negative national media coverage trends, as well as have a good grasp of existing national education campaigns that support uh, humane and ethical animal research, as well as those that educational campaigns that we might call propaganda here in the research community that oppose um, animal research that is humane, uh, oppose it in, in any event, in any situation. So I'm just gonna, we, we got a wonderful uh, overview yesterday of polling um, from Drs. Newsom and, and Thompson Iritani. Uh, the Foundation for Biomedical Research does some polling which uh, largely, uh, is, was largely similar to uh, what they showed yesterday just wanted to emphasize this one fat, this one poll finding, and we're going to be doing more polls uh, along these lines from uh, our 2022 polls poll with Hopkins Medicine. We asked participants uh, whether they were aware um, that there are veterinary specialists who care for animals in biomedical research, and 67% were unaware that such specialists exist which was a surprise to us, and only 21% were aware. And I, you know, we're gonna dig it more into this at, in our next poll to see whether the general population is aware of the three Rs, is aware of um, the different things that go into animal welfare, the different components. But overall, our impression is that the general public is not very much, a, not very aware of the field of lab animal science, what it entails and what it is. So again, I'm, I'm still going over the landscape here. Um, so not much public awareness about what this community does overall. Um, also, 
we have to be, there are a lot of campaigns um, that are targeting animals in research. Um, there are different uh, reasons. Sometimes there are situations where mistakes have been made and the research community really strives to excel in the care of animals, but there have been situations where um, welfare violations have occurred. And some of these uh, campaigns against animal research are triggered by that. Others are triggered by just beliefs, uh, very um, extreme beliefs that there should be no animal research. I think previous talks have talked about all of this. And we just need to be aware that for these different reasons, there currently are um, strong campaigns um, that are opposed to canine research and non-human primate research. And um, the media coverage um, has not facilitated this matter. As you can see with the screenshot of the Nature article, how wild monkeys laundered for science could undermine research. Um, and then above that, the um, sort of um, symbolic image of the uh, dog destined for research with the, uh, his ear tattooed there. So we will, it's great, and we should continue to um, increase our openness in communication about animal research, but we have to be careful and we have to be mindful of these types of information campaigns that try to say the opposite, essentially, of what we are saying. For this, we must make sure that what we present in our public education campaigns and our media interviews is scientifically and factually accurate, backed up by peer-reviewed references for every statistic that we provide. And while what constitutes inflammatory, non-inflammatory is up for debate, there's something subjective about it, but we can all agree in general on what an inflammatory image is um, in an animal research lab versus uh, a non-inflammatory one. And I won't go into detail, but um, another thing that we need to keep in mind as we get into this, um, this openness movement that is, that is taking a hold and that is gonna help increase, uh, increase confidence in science is the tone of the news stories that come out. Um, like I said earlier, news stories inform education campaigns both for and against animal research. The media has a pivotal role. I think it's been mentioned by other speakers yesterday. Uh, I forget who said the great point that talking to the media is like talking to the public. I think it was Paul McKellips. And so um, here is a screenshot of the foundation's um, uh, media database. I know that um, AMP and, and other groups have the same thing. This is one of the features where you can see the sentiment of the news stories. Uh, this, this is the stories about the Foundation for Biomedical Research. But the point is that you want the stories, when you talk to the media, you want the stories that come out to look like that upward curve, where it's a positive sentiment and not where neutral is OK. What you don't want is the downward curve. And how do you do that? Well, as a scientist, you have to find out who you're about to talk to, because once you talk to them, you are going to be quoted for the most part. So what topics does that journalist cover? What organizations do they typically or frequently quote or cite? And what are their specific areas of interest? Based on that, you can make an informed decision. You should respond. It is important to be open. But you can make an informed decision about whether to provide a statement or whether to provide a live phone interview, um, a lab tour, and um, additional information. You just have to know who you will be talking to. So um, my takeaways uh, are that um, I'm excited about the openness movement. The benefits that I see are that we are finally moving to a proactive rather than a reactive approach to um, public education and, and media about this, uh, this topic that is so near and dear to all of us and has been kept sort of um, under a lid, if you will. I, I also think the openness approach is a way to foster and build trust. Um, you can't earn trust if you don't give trust. 
and also also it's a wonderful opportunity for um, members of the community to collaborate more together and communicate more and not create these silos that contribute to the culture of secrecy. Um, basically, I just wanted to say, you know, the things, to, the strategic advice I have is just um, to stay on top of public opinion as we engaged in, as we engage in further um, openness, uh, stay on top of media sentiment and media sentiment trends. These databases that we have, that the advocacy groups have, almost every college, uh, university public relations office has, and you can gauge with these curves, if you set it up correctly, how your public sentiment is going for the media interviews you're giving. Um, you, you have to be ready for criticism and pushback. These um, information or, or misinformation campaigns, whatever we want to call them, against canine and, and non-human primate research are real. I wish they weren't there, they are. Um, and uh, find your own voice. This has been reiterated multiple times uh, before by, by other great speakers here. And um, for that, you have, uh, of course, the community, which with the openness agreement will be able to support each other in finding its own voice. And you also have the advocacy groups and, and your communications department. Um, so I think I will leave it at that. Thanks, Eva. Great, thank you. Uh, fantastic advice, as usual. Um, it was really great too to hear, um, you know, this this you know different sort of perspective as uh, perspectives of openness from from a scientist. Thank you, Christine. Uh, from an institutional perspective, as shared by Jim, um, and then and then from what's happening over. Um, in, in the UK. So thanks, Wendy. So we've got a lot of great questions that have come in and um, we're all interested in uh, different aspects of this, this topic and we all have different experience with this topic. So I think first we're gonna pull up a poll uh, to find out from you all where along the spectrum of openness that you've had personal experience. And so as we're waiting for that poll to come up, um, and this could be, you know, you, your personal experience, your experience with your institution, you know, however you want to interpret that. But zero experience with openness would be um, you have no experience with any information provided outside of those involved in research, which um, might be impossible to achieve if you're publishing work and things like that. But, um, you know, that would be zero. And 100% openness would be... Um, you have experience in all information about every aspect of, of the research or, or research institution or work in research that you're involved with um, is shared. Um, and our little description says all the way to personal health information, you know, your address and, and everything else. So take a few minutes to, to fill that out so we could see where everybody is on the spectrum of openness. Yeah, it's uh, just experience. So it doesn't, it's not, it could be positive, negative, neutral. It's just your experience. Okay, and I think once we stop seeing numbers coming in, we could probably end the poll and see, see what we see. All right, so thank you all for participating in that. And it, it looks pretty even. It looks like we have, um, you know, those that, that responded to the poll um, are along the spectrum of openness. So, you know, from, from very little experience with openness to um, lots of experience with openness. And, and that's typical. That's pretty much where we are um, as individuals here in the United States and as institutions. So thank you for, for helping with that. And that really is a reflection on, on, on where we are in the United States. Uh, so we're gonna uh, start answering some questions. 
So let me bring up our, our question panel. And I also encourage uh, speakers, panelists um, that you know just presented, if you have questions for each other, uh, all you have to do if you're online is, is raise your hand and we'll make sure to get those in as well. Okay, so our first question um, that came in is actually for Dr. Latin. Um, what do the harassment campaigns focus on now after you've changed your tactic and become more communicative about the work that you do? Yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. I, I do see that sometimes the campaigns are actually kind of rehashing some of the same information, but trying to find new audiences. Um, so for example, when I moved to Louisiana from Connecticut, there was kind of a big uptick at that point in you know the newsletters that were sent out and um, press releases that were sent to local media and some of the, the Louisiana State University kind of student, student media outlets, I think hoping to kind of get a new audience for some of the same types of messages that had been tried previously. Um, one of the other things that has shifted um, over the, just, you know, from my postdoc to my faculty position um, is that, you know, at my postdoc position, I was at Yale, which is a private institution. Now I'm at LSU, which is a public university. And there have, I've seen a lot more of these kinds of like open records requests. And um, we're actually also currently dealing with some legal efforts to try to get access to my unpublished research materials. So there's been a little bit of a shift away from some of the, um, I, I would say more kind of like, you know, uh, newsletters specifically targeting specific aspects of my research, although there's still some of that and more of a, a shift towards some of these potential, um, yeah, open records requests and those types of things. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this question is for Jim. Um, can you, do you know, okay, can you uh, comment on the Oregon state laws on FOIA requests? Um, specifically, do you, are there any protections for researchers or, or yeah, okay. Sure. Um, you know, I, th I think uh, one of our presenters mentioned this previously, but there is a tremendous, I think it might've been Nicole, there is a tremendous amount of transparency in the US when it comes to um, public records. So there's, you know, certainly FOIA, which is federal, and then there's state records laws. The, you know, most states are, are really quite open in regards to what you can obtain, uh, a tremendous amount of information, especially for, of course, public institutions. Uh, as for the question, so it really does vary, but um, Oregon would definitely be one of those states that is sort of on the spectrum of being tr incredibly transparent. Uh, while I was at OHSU, again, this was, you know, approximately 10 years ago, but during that time, we were having heavy targeting of our individuals that worked with larger animals. So um, people who worked with, with non-human primates, et cetera, and they were being targeted on a very personal level. You know, that's when we had the home harassment, the vandalizing of the houses and cars and things like that. So we went to our legislature and said, listen, we believe we should um, certainly maintain transparency, but at the same time, uh, campaigns targeting individuals, private people who don't have security and who are being harassed at home, who are having their houses vandalized, et cetera, is there something we can do to help protect them? And so we worked with the legislature and came up with a, an exemption where people who work with large animals, when, when their records were requested from our institution, we were able to redact their names. So you had all of the information about the research they were doing, the treatment of animals, et cetera, but we just removed the name simply because certainly those who oversee animal research, the USDA, et cetera, have access to all of that information, but private citizens uh, or individuals who specifically want to use this to weaponize campaigns against individual people, they lost some access to that. And, and so that, um, that was something that was created years ago. I believe it still is in existence. However, again, I haven't lived in Oregon for 10 years now, so um, I believe that still exists. And we thought it was a really good sort of way to maintain uh, a vast amount of transparency, but uh, sort of take away some of the ability to go after individuals involved in science. Because really, this is, should be a discussion about research as a whole, not about one individual person. I, I personally think that's a really bad strategy to go after individuals. And I, I really hope that all the groups that are that do that will reconsider that, that um, strategy, because I think it's kind of a losing strategy. Um, and it, um, you know, just it's, it's also pretty, pretty appalling, to tell you the truth. 
Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, this question is for Wendy. Is the Concordat gathering and present presentation of data funded by the UK government? So is the Concordat funded by the government? Um, not directly. Um, the Concordat is funded, well, we as an organization carry out all the administration around the Concordat. The individual signatories do their own work and, and they will cover the costs of that, although that's often not a very expensive thing for them to be doing. Um, we do have Concordat signatories that are part of government. So some of the um, some of the agencies of government have signed the Concordat. And then we do get funding via the UK Research Councils, UK Research and Innovation, um, give us some funding each year to support the Concordat. And when it was set up for the first few years, we had funding from the Wellcome Trust um, specifically to support it. And that was the, the reason that those organisations want to support it is they, they don't want us to have to charge a large amount of money for people to sign the Concordat. They don't want barriers um, and they don't want that to be an, an issue for, for organisations. So we do have some very small medical research charities and we want to encourage them to be um, uh, able to join up. And so that's why that, that funding is important. But no, it's not a project that's directly funded by government. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, this question is for all of you. Um, and actually, Nicole, I encourage you to, to chime in uh, by just unmuting since you're sitting right over there, if, if you feel so moved to do so. Um, okay, the question is for all of you, are, is there going to be a concerted effort across multiple institutions to be more transparent and aligned on how they communicate their animal research? At my institution, we've been engaged in convincing leadership to be more transparent, but it still feels like the places that are willing to be open are the exception. I think that safety and numbers element can go a long way uh, to help reduce understandable institutional you know, fears or anxieties or hesitations to opening and becoming more vulnerable. Uh, so could this be achieved through some official mandate to provide annual reports on animal research? So there's lots in there and there's lots that is happening. So I didn't know if anybody wanted to comment on all or, or certain pieces of that. Could I start on that? That'd be great. Yeah, just because exactly that, that was exactly why we organized the Concordat the way we did. It was that safety in numbers idea um, before the Concordat, there were maybe one or two institutions, one or two individuals in the UK that were prepared to talk about their animal research. And so what we felt was that we needed to have a good number of institutions signed up before we published it. And we had 72 organisations when we first published it. And as I said, there are now 126. And the UK is a small country, so that is effectively it's more or less 90 percent plus of all the institutions in the uk that that carry out animal research or that fund animal research or that have members who carry out or fund animal research so it's a we have now we really have got that critical mass um that safety in numbers and after 10 years we're now in a position where the question is not why aren't you know it, it's sort of why are these organizations that haven't signed why haven't they signed what is it that they're doing that's so awful they can't talk about it? Um, why? And so those organize. Interestingly, I mentioned about um, that we still do have campaigns uh, against the use of animal research in the UK. That hasn't gone away. But generally speaking, they tend to be focused on organizations that haven't signed the Concordat. And this is Nicole. I can speak a little bit too to that's exactly what um, we're hoping to achieve with the USARO initiative. Um, and also we know that that's a challenge um, for many who want to be more open, but their institutional leadership is um, you know, is, is hesitant or, or, or is, is enough removed that they're not quite there yet is um, we want to be able to do that. So that's part of our, our goal in bringing in the exemplars and then um, working with each other to provide resources to be able to have those conversations with leadership. And our goal is to get to a place like what Wendy was just saying, where, um, you know, it really makes more sense to be open than it does to not. Um, so that is the goal. <laughs> Oh, 
Great, thank you. And I just want to point out that um, with Wendy, you remind um, us this all the time, but um, we do have a lot of institutions in the United States that are doing something with openness. And Nicole shared a lot of examples of that, whether it could be a statement on your website, uh, giving tours, or visiting classrooms, or, or whatever it is. So, so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, so we just need to increase the number of institutions more consistently uh, doing together and know that each other are doing it. So it doesn't feel like you're alone. Uh, so Jim has something to add. Yeah, I just have one quick thing to add to that is my experience um, in sort of working at an institution that ex greatly expanded openness was the analogy I like to provide is, is a little bit like a vaccination is that I realized that when we were talking about what we did, defining what we did, showing how we cared for animals, introducing the public to the people who work with animals, um, you know, the public wanted to hear those that information. They wanted to learn more. And so you, it, it helped us the next time we faced a major challenge, which was our next infiltration, was because the public already knew a lot about us. We weren't some mysterious uh, facility sort of behind, you know, in the woods there. We had, we'd invited a lot of the, the members of the public in. We did a lot of news stories. Reporters came to us all the time, did tons of tours. So, you know, it, I really consider it like a vaccination. And, you know, I, I think there's sort of a this belief that if you don't say anything, if you don't talk about what you do, you're automatically safe. And I think that institutions tend to forget that, well, there's a tremendous amount of, of transparency already. There's records requests, there's USDA inspections, there's, uh, you know, any letters you may need to send to OLA, there, um, there are your, there's PubMed, there's publications, there's funding documents, et cetera. And so the question is, do you want to allow those who are opposed to take all that information and tell their own story? Or are you interested in telling the story yourself? Um, so it's just, I think it's kind of a, a fable that there's this ability to stay quiet and things will be quiet, or that nothing will happen when in reality, a tremendous amount of information is about you is already out there. And so why not be the ones to gather those pieces together and tell the story? Awesome. Um, another question, and this is for um, any of the panelists. What have any of you experienced to be the biggest forces against openness? What has been their biggest arguments? Um, can I speak to that one? I, I actually, this sort of just builds on what Jim was just saying, where um, one of the things I think that's really surprised me was that, you know, sometimes some of the biggest opponents to openness about animal research is actually other scientists. And I think it's for the reason, I mean, a very understandable reason, right? That, you know, some of these scientists are afraid of becoming a target of, of harassment, right? And I think, you know, exactly as Jim was just saying, you know, if you are a scientist, it is clear that you are doing animal research because you publish papers about that research and you present that research at conferences and you present it at departmental seminars and, you know, it, it's out there, right? And and there are also, you know, depending on your funding sources and your institution, like, yeah, there are these records requests and things like that. So this information about animal research is available, even if you're not posting on social media about it or talking to journalists or doing outreach, right? I And I think Jim is absolutely right that it's really important that you think about, okay, well, this information is available. Like, how do you want to communicate about the work that you're doing? And, you know, I really think that animal research is a privilege and not a right. And part of our responsibility in doing this work with animals is to communicate about it, communicate how it's done, why it's done, and what are the results of it that, that, that can benefit not just people, but also animals themselves, right? So, you know, I really think there's a really strong ethical reason for openness and not just kind of a, a practical reason for openness. And, you know, the public pays for a lot of the work that we do, right? And so there's also another reason to make sure that we're communicating about what it is that we're doing and what are we learning and, you know, how is this all moving science forward, right? So I think, um, you know, I, I really think when, when I talk to scientists and they say, oh, I never tell people that I do animal research and this and that, I think I think you have to really kind of, yeah, you have to make the case to to those folks and just lay it all out there and be like, you know, you, your your silence will not protect you, right? Like it's it's 
it's you gotta you gotta actually talk about it and be willing to engage with it and be willing to advocate for it right because otherwise i think um you know if if not you then who right <laughs> yeah yeah and certainly when when we were setting up the concordat in the uk it, the biggest barrier was the fear um of what would be the results and we did have to take a lot of faith you know we a lot of people had to put a lot of trust in the idea that this project was going to help things and i think it is interesting it, it was two years later after our um concordat was published that spain spain was the next country that did one and i think they they probably did wait to see what the results were in the uk and i did spend a lot of time in those years going around with lots of other people trying to encourage other countries to follow the what we followed in this direction and and the message really was look you know nothing bad has happened obviously we can't promise that nothing bad will ever happen um we do still have protest and campaigns and that's fine that's part of living in a democracy and it's useful to have that challenge but what we need is to be able to provide the public with our side of the story, which they haven't had for so many years. All this information and all the videos and all the imagery have been put out there by people who are opposed to animal research and it's horrible to look at. And you know that's not the truth. So just go ahead and, and put that information out there for the public. And it's it, I, I mentioned earlier, we, we published with 72 organizations and we've had another 50 plus who've joined in the intervening years. Again, some institutions waited to see. They just waited to see what would happen. But we have continually had more institutions joining. So I would say the biggest barrier is that fear. But I hope that our experience in the UK and the experience of other European countries and now Australia and New Zealand as well is that, you know, do this and still nothing bad has happened. And just to quickly add, I, the fear, and I, this is an interesting, there's probably also, the fear is probably also based on, um, do we have the right resources, information, and strategic advice to do this? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I think that is part of the reason for the fear, which is part of the reason for the reluctance. So. I have a question for Nicole, maybe Wendy. Uh, Nicole, you presented a, a, a spectrum to compassion uh, where we're going. Uh, is there something when we do these initiatives that leads to greater passion for what we do? So go past compassion for what we do and actually have passion for what we do. Uh, how will your organization do it and how did it work with the UK? That's a really, that's a fantastic question and I love it. Um, I. Honestly, I don't know that I have a good answer to it. Um, I can say that our passion, so when we, when I know for me and I know I've experienced this because I can get very passionate and excited. And I think when we're talking passionately, we're not answering questions, we're not in an inquisition, but we're, we're really excited about it, um, that that passion can be contagious. So I think that that's, um, that's one of the ways um, I sometimes can get carried away. I'm just speaking for myself and my own experiences, but I can be talking to, um, you know, I like to now, I, I feel a little more comfortable talking about what I do. You know, there, some of us can be constrained just by um, institutional lines and things like that. And now that I'm kind of a free agent, I feel like I can speak very freely about what I'm doing. I can't, you know, I have proprietary things or, you know, proprietary is probably not a good word anymore, but like, you know, there's, there's certain trade secrets I can't just, just talk about, but like just my enthusiasm for what I'm doing, I feel I can be much more open about. And I will, you know, as I'm giving blood or something, I, I'll talk about how my dog's a blood donor and he was part of a program that developed treatments for this. Um, you know, I think that our, when we're talking very passionately about it. And we're just very excited about what we're doing that that can be contagious and that can really spread um, and people can feel that. And even when they're like, I'm not sure how I feel about this but this person's really excited about it. it that can, it can help um, you know, get them to really understand why we're passionate and possibly even be passionate about the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Hope that's useful. <laughs> 
we've talked um, a lot about openness, but at the same time, there is an increasing push in our government for research security. And in fact, we see contracts that come in for funding of certain projects that do have restrictive terms in them. You know, a drug company doesn't want you to sell their drug for them, that they want to control that. So there are restrictions on what you can say about your research uh, in certain areas. We're seeing more research. I haven't seen any animal research at our institution that's coming in as controlled, uh, unclassified information, CUI, which has very strict terms about dissemination. And then our institution does not do classified research, but many do. I have no idea if there's any classified animal research out there. If you talk about that research, then you go to jail. So there are restrictions out there you have to be aware of in terms of funding of particular projects. So it's not just all one-sided. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's definitely not one size fits all. Um, we have to wrap up. So I didn't, I just wanted to provide the opportunity for the panelists to, if you have any last thoughts or any last comments you'd like to share before we end this session. Can I just come back on that passion point? Um, because I think it's, it, it may not be exactly what you term passion, but one thing that we were we were surprised by with the Concordat was um, the competition that it that it caused. Um, in that, we we were just grateful that people were signing it. What we didn't expect was the signatories to be competing against each other to be the most open uh, and to come up with the new ideas and um, a new way of doing things. And we have a an awards ceremony every year where we. Uh, recognize and celebrate the great work that people are doing and the competition for those awards is fierce now and uh, things that are being submitted now if they'd been submitted eight years ago they definitely have won but we've moved on so much that everyone's doing that now so it's not really worth an award so that the, the envelope is being pushed every year and that that aspect of passion I, I think we've been quite surprised by pleasantly surprised by Um, I'd just like to add um, that there's um, the the internal benefits was something that sort of surprised me about transparency institution is that um, you know employees like it when their leadership says we want you to talk about what you do we we want to feature your work uh, we're proud of you we're um, and so I think that's something to think about uh, often when we're thinking about transparency you're, we're discussing how the public will respond to it how legislators will respond but we don't think about our own employees and I think the message that we send by kind of keeping everything quiet and telling people don't talk about what you do I think that sends a message to a really negative message to employees so I, I would say that think about that other benefit it's a, it's a sort of a secondary benefit uh, but it's also a really important thing to think about. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to all the panelists um, for a great talk and around openness.